It is Friday, December 8th, 2017. We're here in a snowy Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my name is Ashton Ellett. We're here with another installment of the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Joining us today is Mr. Bobby Kahn, um, longtime political uh, worker in the Democratic Party, um, chief of staff to Governor Roy Barnes, and now a, a media consultant. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. Yeah, I used to be a boy wonder, now I'm neither. A, a wunderkind. <laughs> um, you, you're more distinguished with age. Um, I'm the guy that I used to roll my eyes at. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a fate that awaits us all. Um, so just to begin with, tell me a little bit about your, your childhood, your upbringing, you know, your family, and how you became interested in politics. Well, I grew up in Savannah, and my, uh, my dad in particular was very interested in uh, politics. My mother uh, was a reporter for the Savannah paper for a while, and so I was always exposed to it and always interested in the issues. Um, I really got interested in it in 1976 when our former governor was running for president, Right, and I remember watching... Um, uh, the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, <laughs> and getting it, it, that was in the or that was the predecessor to the Daily Show, right? But uh, it was it was highly political. But on Tuesday nights, you'd ha it'd be delayed by ten or fifteen minutes, and they would report the um, the results of the primaries or caucuses in you know in the Democratic and Republican. Uh, primaries and uh, so that was Tuesdays were great I'd get the results and then I'd get Johnny Carson <laughs> uh, so uh, what drew you to did you did you grow up in a, a strong democratic family or uh, it was pretty democratic such as anybody in Georgia uh, was yeah at, no at it was time. pretty democratic uh, pretty liberal um, especially <laughs> the, the, we, we do have to make those distinctions in, in 1970s Georgia yeah, yeah, yeah. liberals were not always Democrats but my, my dad was uh, was was very interested in um, public policy and what was going on and uh, and we talk he was sort of a contrary and he 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 take he took positions just to <laughs> Just to irritate me sometimes. <laughs> now that's come full circle because my son irritates me with the same thing. Uh, <laughs> never goes the other way. But uh, anyway, I um, I was interested in politics, and uh, I ended up going to Emory. I graduated early and worked on uh, President Carter's reelection. That didn't go so well. Um, now, did you work on the in the in the primary with, I, against Ted Kennedy? Yeah, I worked in a couple of states. Okay, and then I left in uh, August to go to law school at University of Georgia, and uh, of course I followed the campaign and mm -hmm. thought he had a chance, and uh, wasn't to be. But uh, while I was over there, I met uh, Wayne Reese, who was um, had had uh, worked in the legislature, or had worked for governor. Governor Harris in the legislature, or he was then appropriations right. chairman, Joe Frank Harris, and, and Wayne got me uh, connected with Governor Harris's campaign, and uh, I worked on that campaign in the summers. So, what what was your role as a, as a as a law student? In the first year was uh, eighty one. That wasn't the campaign. I was doing right. research, and then I came back over in the in the. Um, summer of 82 and I worked as Fulton County coordinator and Governor Harris got the nomination to the surprise of many and I was getting ready to go back to law school and I said I think I'll stay around for this one which you know back then if you delayed school you know they, they didn't think you were coming back. Right. <laughs> In fact I called uh, the uh, law school the day, the first day of class, Frank Polster, who's who was a legend over there, and I said, uh, "I'll see you in January." He said, "Well, it's about time you called. You can't just do that." <laughs> I said, "Well, I did. Sorry, I've, I've been busy." And uh, well, tell me about that Democratic uh, primary. You're Fulton County um, coordinator. So, so Joe Frank Harris is from Cartersville, up in Bartow County. 
yeah, Fulton County, the way I remember it is that, that was sort of Norman Underwood, uh, Daw- it was, uh, who, who? Dawson Mathis. Y- yes. No, he ran for the Senate. Right. In um, 80. Um, it was Jack Watson. Jack, Jack Watson, Watson, Norman Underwood, Buck Melton. Oh, yeah, Macon Mary. Bo Ginn, mm-hmm. Billy Lovett. Right, right. Uh, there were, I, I remember there being a debate. There were like two or three levels. <laughs> and uh, Governor Harris made the runoff mm-hmm. with Bo Ginn, who was my congressman. Um, what do you think explains that, that, you know, Joe Frank, it, was it simply his connections as appropriations chair, his connections with Speaker Murphy that were significant enough to push him into a runoff with a big field like that? That, that was significant, but I, I mean, I'll tell you, looking in retrospect, I, I mean, it was message. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he was stability. He was no tax increase. Mm-hmm. Um, he was experienced. He was conservative. And, yes, he was. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it was all of those things. But, uh, you know, I'm a little partial to message these sure, days. Sure, sure. And parts of Fulton County, we worked hard. Mm-hmm. North Fulton and South Fulton. Um, we did our part in the city with uh, legislators. Mm-hmm. You know, Sidney Marcus was a very big part of that campaign. He had, he had run for mayor, mm-hmm. um, but he uh, he was a big part of that campaign. And a lot of the legislators were. They, uh, Governor Harris had huge legislative support, and and that that was important. It was an important in a place like, you know, we weren't going to win Fulton County in the primary, but we were going to get some votes. Right, right. You know, cut cut your margin, mm-hmm. so to speak. Yeah. So what was it like going from a really you know, hard-fought Democratic primary to the general election against a Republican, Bob Bell, um, back in the early 80s? Um, Did everybody just take a vacation? Or was that- <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was, it was kind of, um, I mean, you run scared, and we were scared. We didn't know. They didn't, they didn't share polls with us. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, we saw the Atlanta news, and this was going to be the first Republican governor and, and all that. So we were, we were running scared. And, um, but it was um, worked hard mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and won, and it was great. The, the message that, that, that Bob, and I'm a, I'm a lot more fam- familiar with the Republicans' uh, positions and messaging back from back then, Bob Bell ran on basically an anti-corruption campaign that, that Joe Frank Harris was essentially uh, an enforcer, so to speak, for, for Speaker Murphy. Um, and that it was crony capitalism, you know, a word, couple of words that are thrown around a lot these days. Um, how, how did you go about messaging, counter-messaging that? Campaign. I, I, I wasn't in the message business. He wasn't back then. I was. I, I was. I stuck. I stuck to my sandbox. Uh, <laughs> but I will tell you this: that's a good message. Uh, Joe Frank Harris was the wrong person to run that message against uh, because he he was he was clean, he was accountable, mm-hmm. he was responsible. People liked him, and uh, you know that that might have worked against others, but it didn't work against Joe Frank Harris. Um, so what did you do after uh, after the, the campaign? So so Joe Frank Harris is sworn in in, in 83. So yeah. where, do you, where do you go from there? I, I, I went back to see Mr. Polster to see if he would let me back into the law school. <laughs> and he obviously did. He did, and uh, I graduated uh, in the summer. Uh, so did I. There's no shame in that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I graduated from Emory early to go to work for Carter. It all so, works out. Yeah. It balances. Um, and uh, I really wanted to go to get into politics uh, right away, but some people gave me some good advice. If you don't practice law now, you never will. And so I went and I practiced law with Jim Oxendine, who I'd met in the campaign. And this is John John's Oxendine's dad. father. Yeah. And uh, it was a... It was a general practice, did a little bit of everything. Oh, yeah. Um, almost uh, screwed up an uncontested divorce. Uh, <laughs> it seems like there's a story that we probably shouldn't record there, but. <laughs> it, it, it came out all right. Tough judge who was especially tough on. Uh, new lawyer. On new lawyers. And um, 
So I worked there a couple of years while I was working for Jim. Uh, uh, Governor Harris had appointed uh, Robert Benham to the Court of Appeals, first African American statewide. Right. right. And I took a little time and ran that campaign. Now you were, I, I read somewhere that you were offered, or maybe you told me this, you were offered to, to run the, the, the Mondale Ferraro campaign in Georgia. Yeah. And you turned that down. I, 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 it was a gem of a job. I can't <laughs> believe you turned it down. Um, well, you know, when you when you win, everybody wants you. I not had that feeling lately. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but, uh, no, I, I couldn't keep doing politics, at least then. Mm-hmm. As it turned out, I spent a lot of time working in the general election as what would now be known as the coordinated campaign. And uh, because Georgia, this is how, this is what an uphill battle Walter Mondale had. Georgia was one of the states that was targeted because um, of Carter. Right, right. And, I mean, it was 60-40. Four years later, Georgia was targeted because we had the convention, and we actually did some stuff and had a real campaign, uh, more so than in 84. Mm Mm-hmm. And the results were 60-40. <laughs> well, you became executive director of the party. Um, were you appointed by, by Governor Harris or by the, by the state chair? It, it, it's it was really John Henry Anderson, the state chair, okay. and the executive committee. Okay. John Henry appointed me in the state executive committee, uh, confirmed me. Right, okay. But that's a governor's operation. Right. Unless the governor doesn't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> and historically, the Democratic Party of Georgia is very much a, a governor-controlled yeah. apparatus. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what was the state of the party? You know, you're in charge of the day-to-day affairs of the party. What was the state of the, the, the party organization as you found it in, what was it, it was, uh, September 85? 85, yeah. Like well, we'd come out of um, the, um, the 84 race, and, it, and we lost. You know, that was when Cobb and Gwinnett flipped. Right, right. Uh, a lot of that started in 80, but it finished in 84. And we were losing suburbs, like big. And Newt had gone out and recruited a bunch of people for. Yeah, Operation Breakthrough. Yeah, the, and, and, he, and he was at the school board operation. level and that sort of thing. And those people were then emerging, and they'd put a warm body on the ballot, <laughs> and they'd win. Um, Maybe there's a lesson for, for Democrats there, 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 there damn sure is, and, and, and we, we've had some problems with recruiting the last few cycles, especially in the House. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, uh, so there, there was a lot of, um, you know, there was some morale problems. Mm-hmm. And uh, my friend Bert Lance had been the chair, and he stepped down. Um, and John Henry Anderson, who had served in the legislature with Governor Harris, mm-hmm. uh, county commissioner from Pulaski County, uh, became chair, and I, I was the executive director. And we sort of, you know, changed, made, made it more, more appealing to legislators, I guess, and more connected to legislators. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were a service organization for for elected officials, okay, and a lot of, a lot of in terms of, of, of research or first the, the main schools, thing we did, like the main that. thing we did, and it, it may not seem like a big deal now, but we uh, built the first statewide voter file, all 159 counties. Now that's done now, sure, because of the Help America Vote Act. That's done. You can walk down to the yeah. Secretary of State's office and get it. But we we, we built it. it and uh, we, we had people going around to the counties. Some counties didn't want to sell us the file. Some of them were actually handwritten. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, we matched it with phone numbers. And uh, that, that was the first real voter file. And we, we, we uh, made it available to elected officials and to campaigns. We worked with the Senate campaigns. Uh, they were very interested in the voter file. This was uh, for the... Uh, for, for the Mattingly for 86. seat. 86. And it was a seat that White Fowler ultimately won. And he was a, they, they took advantage of the voter file. Uh, and so, you know, we, we changed our reputation. We were computerized. Yeah. We were a service organization and so on and so forth. And uh, 
what was what was what was fundraising like for for the state party back then? Well, when uh, when when John Henry and I went in there, there there were two employees and a debt. Now the debt was um, there are a lot of reasons for it, but there were so we rate we had a fundraiser and we paid the debt off, and then we uh, we, we we built the. Uh, we, we, we raised money around the voter file, mm -hmm. and we raised money around the Senate race. And so we were, we had a real coordinated campaign. You, you said raise money off the voter file. Is, is that like direct mail, direct no, appeals? No, no. Or I anything? mean, we, to, we raised money to build the voter file. Gotcha. And I'm there thinking. were, you know, there were groups and, and elected officials that, that, pay, that, that contributed to that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it, it was, we were, we, we faced skepticism at first. You're really going to computerize all the voters? And, uh, but then, uh, then, then, you know, we were doing something. Mm -hmm. And there was enthusiasm. And so we had that going on, and we, had a, we were raising money for a coordinated campaign for the general election to take back the Senate seat, um, which we did. Well, t tell me about that, that, that um that 86 race, because Mac Mattingly, who had upset Herman Talmadge, a very unique race, 30, 35% African-American vote, crossing over to vote for a yeah. Republican uh, in 80. The Democratic primary did not sport many heavy hitters. It was it was Weich Fowler, who's 5th fifth, fifth Congressional District Representative, uh, Hamilton Jordan, Hamilton. and I, I think a relative of... of Senator Russell, John Russell, John was a Russell, legislator, who was, uh, but but, and uh, Roy Barnes had had considered getting into the Roy, race. Roy Barnes and Larry Walker, who were floor leaders for the right. governor, had toyed with it. Roy actually got into it, mm -hmm. and then he traveled around the state and figured out he didn't want to be in the Senate. <laughs> um, and he had small kids at the time too. Right, right. And um, Dave Garrett was right. in there. He got out before the primary. Okay, but. Um, you know, it was really Hamilton and White. Um, there, there's always been a rumor, um, and we spoke briefly off camera about this, about that the, there was a deal between Mac Mattingly's campaign and, and either the Democratic Party of Georgia or, or Joe Frank Harris's office that they weren't going to make a play against Mac if, if, if the Republicans wouldn't make a play against Joe Frank in 86. Yeah. What... What amount of truth what, <laughs> is there to that? Um, I expect that there wasn't a deal with Joe Frank Harris mm -hmm. and there wasn't a deal with the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that Tom Perdue, who was the governor's chief of staff at the time, uh, was friendly with uh, Mattingly. Um, and, uh, I, and Tom believed it was not in the best interest of of Governor Harris for there to be a strong opponent to Mattingly. Uh, that's the closest thing to a deal there was, but um, John Henry, the chairman, John Henry Anderson, shielded the party from any problems. Mm -hmm. And Governor Harris participated in, uh, in fundraising. Mm -hmm. he, he, he talked about the voter file. He uh, after White Fowler got the nomination, he appeared. Governor Harris appeared with White in the whole ticket, and uh, to the chagrin of many Republicans yeah, who yeah. I mean, I remember didn't expect that. Pictures of top of the Sloppy Floyd Building, and it was um, it was the whole ticket there. It was great. Now, before '86, you had to deal with a high-profile uh, switchover in the party. Billy Lovett, who, who was, I don't know if he was chair of the PSC at the time. I th maybe he would have been because Mac Barber had re Maybe Mac Barber was still. He regardless. Was on the PSC. Regardless. Yeah. He was on the PSC. Um, you had ran a, run against him in 82 um, in the Democratic primary. Tell me about that party switch and how, how the party handled it. That, that's a very good question. And I don't get to tell this much, but. <laughs> We knew it was coming, and it was when I first started the party. Yeah, and, I think October maybe of '85. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 
I remember meeting with a couple of people who I deal with to this day, you know, research, friends in research, friends in politics, and we mm-hmm. come up with this whole line of response because my background in, was in debate. Mm-hmm. And we'd come up with ways to hit him and everything. And I didn't know John Henry very well at the time, but you know, we did all this and I, there were no fax machines. <laughs> And I called him up and I said, this is what we want to say. And it was a whole, you know, we were just going to kick the crap out of him. And he said, I, I think you're paying too much attention to him. I, I, think, I think I'll just say it raises the intelligence of both parties. <laughs> and boy, was he right. I mean, <laughs> you do not, you know, you don't give him the time of day. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, uh, you know... It was a good. It was a good lesson. I was a little frustrated because we'd done all this work, but I mean, that was brilliant. That was absolutely brilliant. What do you think that that sort of party switch? What what, what did it mean materially for the party to lose? It was a continuation of, you know, the hits. Okay. You know, the the suburbs were going. Uh, not that. In retrospect, not that we had a chance at the presidential race, but uh, well, I guess it started in '80 with Carter losing the presidency, Mattingly winning the Senate, um, and then you know we started losing all you know these legislative seats. wasn't a meaningful number, but it was it was a number. And then uh, and then in '84, Pat Swindle beat Elliot Levitas right, right in, in, in the fourth district. Which we took back in 1990, 1988, mm-hmm. uh, with Ben Jones. Cooter. Mm-hmm. Go ahead and hold that up to the camera. The Duke's a hazard. Cooter's a garage. It's it's a it's an action figure. Signed to Bobby from U.S. Representative Ben Jones. Yeah. Who, uh... so, so anyway, um, I got my toys. <laughs> uh, Anyway, it, it was just a you know we lost the fourth. We were we lost Cobb. We lost Gwinnett. South Metro mm-hmm. with Gingrich was just you know crazy bad, and uh, we, we it was not going well. What did you do at the party um, in an effort to contain uh, the Republican gains to con- you know, contain them in the in, in the donut? Uh, in those sort of metropolitan beachheads, Columbia County, places yeah, like that? Not much. <laughs> uh, I mean, we tried. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you're up against a wave, and there was a wave in, in those areas, but, um, I mean, there were, uh, there were legislators who, were, who had seniority, were committee chairs, uh, and they were just going down to nobody's. Um, which is a lesson, again, which we can get to for, sure. for today. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we, we were, as a party, we were trying to be um, united. Uh, we were giving them tools, voter file, uh, you know, uh, professional campaigns or professional in its time. Uh, campaigns and that sort of thing, uh, but we still took some. Were hits. your candidates were, were were Democratic candidates, Democratic office holders used to that? Right? No. How, how hard was it, I guess, to acclimate them to to the reality of a modern two party system? It was tough. It, it, it was tough. There were, there were some. Well, I'm just going to do what I normally do, and the friends uh, and neighbors, yeah, and have and, a barbecue. And I, I, there's one high ranking uh, high ranking legislator uh, who. So what am I going to do with a bunch of labels with voters on them? <laughs> That's what it was back then, labels. Right, right. I mean, you could get a, a tape. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what am I going to do with that? Uh, and, uh, but, but, you know, we, we had a core, you know, recruits and newer legislators mm-hmm. who, who wanted it. There were some that had been doing it themselves. Um, and they liked what we had. Uh, Cobb had, you know, they'd been dealing with this for a long time. Right, right. And that's really where I got to know Roy. I met him in the 82 campaign, but we were trying to hold on to uh, Cobb County. And um, 
there were there were there were specials out there that we uh, that we uh, that we had to contest. Didn't go too well. So so you got involved with with then Representative Barnes um, in the in the eighties. Senator. That's correct, Senator, and then Representative. You uh, you would know better than than I, but yes. Senator Barnes, so South, South Cobb, Mableton mm -hmm. area. Uh, walk me through how he decides, you know, he took, he tested the waters in 86, didn't want to be a, a senator. Yeah. Um, how he decided to, to jump into that 1990 race and your role in that campaign. Yeah, he, um, I, I, I'd been talking to Roy, you know, I'd known him and I started talking to him in 88, really, about the governor's race. Um, and he decided to run, and and he was, you know, going to run in the model in a model of Joe Frank Harris and George Busby. It worked for them. Yeah, they didn't have Zell Miller and Andy Young. <laughs> fair, not a very. I mean, fair I point. still think George if, Busby and Joe Frank would have won, but in 1990, those were two strong opponents. Right. Uh, and, uh, and and Governor Miller, you know, with the lottery and with, the, with all the Senate, and, or most of the Senate, and so on, I mean, that was strong. Andy Young was a force unto himself. Sure, sure. So, um, it w w was it the fact that you have, again, Mayor Young, Lieutenant Governor Miller, the, the core of the, the city vote, the, the African-American vote, by and large going to Andy Young. Um, Governor Miller, who'd been on the ticket since 1974, um, who also had strong suburban support, especially in Gwinnett County, DeKalb yeah. County. Um, was it just you were boxed out because there just it, it was, weren't there was enough no voters? There was no room, but I mean, the truth is Roy got 20 percent, which he outperformed everybody's expectations but our own, because uh, <laughs> he'd been down there in the in the single digits with right. Bubba, the Bubba McDonald uh, territory, and uh, you know he, he, there just wasn't enough room. And, and and Governor Miller, I mean that that yeah, there was experience and there was money, but more than that, there was a message. Yeah, and it was um, the lottery. It wasn't just the lottery, though. It was taking the sales tax off of groceries. Right. It was boot camps, some tough on crime stuff that's being has not undone aged today. Ne ne has not uh, aged necessarily well. And, uh, and, and Andy Young. Uh, was uh, that the one-term pledge as well? Was that in the primary or was that in that, the general? That was a Bill Strip column. I did not know that. There was, Disabusing uh, me of this notion. And, and I'm, Bill is my friend. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I, if 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 Governor Miller made the pledge, I think he un, he walked it back. Sure, sure. Um, so, and then Andy Young, I mean, ambassador, congressman, mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, he was supposed to finish first, mm -hmm. and um, once Zell finished first, it was that was over with. Didn't stop me from helping Andy in the runoff. <laughs> Well, tell me, tell me about the the, um, the 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 fundamentals of, of of a democratic primary in 1990 because we're we're coming up on 2018. There's going to be another primary for for governor. Um, it seems like the demographics are now in favor of an African American candidate. Um, that's not necessarily true, but you know, on the surface, back then, was Zell Miller able to win because there were still enough rural conservative, yellow dog Democrats in the party. I, I think that helped Zell. It also helped Roy get to 20. That he was able to, to, to yeah. tap into that yeah. sort of... Yeah, but Zell, Zell's support was... Pretty broad-based. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because he was known, he traditionally done quite well with the African-American vote. Mm -hmm. Especially um, in 1980. And, yeah, and, uh, but he had a message. And that message was powerful. What what was what was Senator Barnes's message? Um, was it mainly sort of talking for you know, issues? You know, experience new. It was a combination. Okay. You know, he had experience, but he had new ideas. A lot of environment. 
That's right. Um, and uh, he wasn't going to raise taxes. It was, it was, it was, it was in retrospect, uh, you know, uh, Joe Frank 2.0 or George Busby 3.0. So, um, I can but, talk about the eighty, the nineteen ninety eight message a little better. Uh, sh- sure, <laughs> but, sure. But uh, D- no, were you involved in the? Did you ever transition over into the the Zell Miller camp? I voted for him uh, in the general, but um, uh, and I represented him as a lawyer. <laughs> but 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 you were you were not part of the, the reason the I team. the reason I helped Mayor Young was we had the 88 convention. Right, and you were present, was it Atlanta 88? It was Atlanta 88, which was the host organization, and and Andy Young was the chairman of it. Okay. And there was a board of directors that included Governor Harris, uh, County Commission Chair Michael Lomax, because Fulton County and Atlanta helped pay for it. Sure, sure. Uh, Bob Holder with the chamber, he was chairman of the chamber, and John Henry Anderson. And... um, and I worked very well with Mary Young, and you know we, we, we did our part. And I think the convention was pretty successful. I'm not saying it led to the Olympics, but if the convention had been a dud, then I don't think we would have gotten the Olympics. Um, it was kind of a you know a test. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life was go out in March of. 2000, I'm sorry, March of 1989, and to, to Andy Young's house and tell him I was going to help Roy Barnes. And he said, I don't really know Roy Barnes. I hear good things about him. Uh, but if he doesn't make it, will you be with me? I said, yes. How would you describe Andy Young's politics for somebody who, I mean, were a few generation, a generation or so removed from his sort of active political life? I think fundamentally he was a pragmatist. I mean, there was a lot of charisma mm-hmm. and a lot of, you know, ideals, but he was a pragmatist. Sort of in the vein of the, the, the old coalition style, you know, Atlanta coalitions, uh, of the business community, African American leadership community. Is that sort of the, a little bit of that, the vein he, that we're coming he, out of? I mean, he took it. You know, way beyond that. Okay. When you look at what he did in terms of bringing businesses from around the world to Georgia, including Atlanta. Um, I mean, he was a, you know, having been through this mayor's race recently, uh, thinking back to what he did, he, he did not have the business community support. But when he got in there, they loved him. Mm-hmm. They loved him. So, so, what do you do between the the inter? It's not necessarily interregnum since he lost in ninety, but uh, <laughs> the intervening period between ninety and ninety eight. What what is is this where you get into your, your well, current? Well, I'd helped Andy, and so I wasn't going to be doing much in Georgia politics for a while. <laughs> I, not not only did I help Mayor Young when you. Talked to Keith Mason and asked him about this, but I flew around the state with him the day before the election and introduced him. And we were Chris, we were crossing paths with uh, Governor Miller, and Keith was on the plane. Um, but after the the primary, after the runoff, you know, I, I had to figure out what I was going to do. My wife was pregnant, and uh, sort of a, t- a time limit. There. I was looking for. A, work that probably didn't include Georgia politics. And she read in the New York Times that the FCC was cracking down on stations, uh, on television stations for not giving a candidate discount to candidates. And they were issuing refunds. So I called Roy up, being a trial lawyer, and (laughs) also being a creditor of the Barnes campaign. I said, let me read this to you. I said, if they're giving refunds for August and September, shouldn't they give refunds for June and July? He said, you're damn right they should. <laughs> so we started that, and that became a pretty big effort. We ended up representing 40 candidates in 12 oh, wow. states. We represented Governor Miller and Johnny Isaacson, Billy Lovett, 
Uh, we, we had everybody in Georgia, and we represented, you know, we, we were in California, Texas, Florida. Wow. Um, and states in between Virginia. Um, and, uh, um, you know, there, there were, the broadcasters went nuts. You know, they, there's, you know we, we filed suit. We wait till after the election. And we put the man on the stations and we filed suit in the state court of Fulton County. Um, we, we had every intention of going after WSB. Uh, because, I mean, that's AJC, you know, that, they, they really covered that campaign. That was WSB, and, you know, they were the giant. And when we put a demand on the stations, they wrote back and said, yeah, we think there's an issue here. Give us some time. WXIA Channel 11 told us to take a hike. <laughs> so they became the target. And after the first year, we filed a suit against them. Um, and it became a big battle of jurisdiction. Uh, the broadcasters went crying to the SEC. I mean, you talk about uh, you know bureaucratic co-option. So were they were they trying to kick it up to the federal level, yeah. federal courts, yeah. or, or straight to the? They F took it to the F federal F court. FCC. They took it to the federal court, and then they they took it to the SEC. Oh, okay. Uh, and ultimately, it went to the 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 Eleventh Circuit had the case for years. <laughs> And uh, and then um, and in the in the interim, the FCC issued um, preemption preemption order, and we were litigating that. And we we had a case in California uh, that Mike Jablonski argued, and and so, but that was you know five years go by, right? Yeah, and and the jurisdiction battles still weren't resolved, but we had gone ahead and filed under the FCC's rules and it resolved most of the cases. So were your, were your clients technically the, the campaign committees for, for these candidates? It was the candidate and the campaign committees. Okay. I would usually deal, for the winners, I would usually deal with a lawyer or somebody representing them. For I usually dealt with the losers themselves. <laughs> uh, Johnny Isaacs and I talked uh, uh, often. He, he was a client and um, and, uh, you know, Bill Nelson in Florida, he had lost the primary. That's right. And, but now he's a senator. I, I had forgotten about that, and, yeah. Uh, so the, the defeated candidates I would, uh, I would deal with. But, yeah, I mean, we recovered about $4 million nationally. Um, but out of that, you know, the FCC comes up with all these rules and stuff because the, the broadcasters did two, well, they did three things. First, they whined. Second, they wanted the FCC to take jurisdiction. And third, they said, these rules are so complicated, we need you to clarify them. And they did a rulemaking, we participated, and they didn't exactly clarify them, but, you know, I understood them better than most, especially on the candidate side. I said, I can do this. <laughs> so I started uh, advertising, a media buying firm. Okay, so that, that you know that takes us pretty, almost to 1998. Yeah. So so by this time, uh, Senator Barnes is now represented. Yeah, he had gone back to the um, he had gone to the House. Right. And Johnny Isaacson, who had been the House Minority Leader, uh, he ran. He he'd gone to the Senate. So they kind of switch. The, the old switch. Yeah. So 98, uh, the all all expectations are that that. Lieutenant Governor Howard, Pierre Howard, is going to run. Mm -hmm. um, walk, walk me through your experience, uh, uh, Roy Barnes' experience, as, as that race approached. Well, Roy would have announced for governor after qualifying, the end of qualifying in 96. So, okay. But in the last hour of qualifying, he got an opponent for his... House seat, and um, you, you couldn't run, you know, for governor and run for the house. I mean, that that was not good politics. Right. So, I mean, not that the guy was a problem, but but practically speaking, yeah, you couldn't do that. I mean, that would become the issue. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and we didn't need to hand them an issue. So, and and Pierre had been talking about running, but. Had, had not done anything. 
And uh, as we were getting close to the end of the 96 election for House, um, Roy was making calls and Pierre was picking up on them. So he went ahead and announced. I don't know when he announced that he was going to run, but it wasn't, it was probably in October of 96. No. Okay. So after Roy gets elected to the House, um, he forms a committee um, and raises money at the end of 96. You couldn't raise money during the session, or I guess you could back then. Uh, well, anyway, practically you couldn't raise money during the session. So he raised money and he, he had a pretty, you know, a couple hundred thousand, which was good. Sure. Um, and during the session, um, a lot of legislators talked to Roy and Peer. They were concerned that Mike Bowers would get elected if, if Roy and Peer had a nasty primary. And so they were talking, and Roy decided, well, I'll just run for lieutenant governor. And he did for about six months. <laughs> Wasn't even that long. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, I remember going to a fundraiser for Pierre in Blairsville mm -hmm. in September. Um, it was a Wednesday. And, and uh, talked and, you know, everything was going well. And, you know, we had a lot of the same supporters and sure, everything, sure. you know, because we had done the right thing and all that. And then Thursday night, there are all these rumors going around that Pierre was going to drop out. I said, no. In fact, I was supposed to meet with him the next day. And, uh, and, and then on, and Roy was in Florida. Right, right. He was on vacation or yeah. something. And, and lo and behold, he, he called me that morning and said, I, I need to reschedule. How, and by the way, how can I get in touch with Roy? He didn't tell me anything else. <laughs> and, and this was early, so I really hadn't heard. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't believing in the, the first rumors because campaigns are full of rumors. And, and so um, I, I, Roy called me and said, well, what's Pierre want? I said, I don't know. He's looking for you. And by then I'd heard the rumors. And he said, well, I better call him. <laughs> and he said, yeah, he's getting out. And Bert Lance called me. We'd been talking. Okay. And You and Bert Lance. Yeah, had Bert been. and I had been talking about rumors. I mean, Bert was great. Oh, sure, sure. It was, it was, it was an old story. hand. Yeah, it was stories. And, and he called me probably by 10 o'clock that, that morning. I said, no, that, you know, that's not going to happen. He said, I don't know. I've heard it. And that usually meant shit, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, when, when it was confirmed, he said, you tell Roy Barnes that he needs to get back up here and announce for governor before the sun sets. And he did. Hmm. Did you ever, uh, what was your insight into to why the lieutenant governor would drop out so suddenly? Well, I, I, I have pretty easy reason. You know, running statewide for governor or senator in this state is you, you, you gotta you gotta have your heart in it, and and you gotta have you know the fire in the belly and whatever. You can't just go through the motions. For, for and and again, we were all concerned about the looming giant Mike Bowers, um, and. I don't, I don't know if this hypocrisy had been revealed by then, but, uh, well, broadly revealed by then. I thought he was a hypocrite for a lot of other reasons. But, <laughs> um, it, you know, it was going to be a tough race. And, 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 and he had small kids, mm -hmm. and, and he just didn't want to, he wasn't going to go through that, put his family through it. Simple explanation. So... When that happens, you have to shift gears from from running for lieutenant governor. And I'm who who was running for lieutenant governor? Mitch Scandalakis? Uh, no, no, not at that point. Um, well, we were only focused on the primary. At okay, that point. so yeah, okay. And so Mark Taylor even, was running, even. and uh, Steve Langford, who was a Democrat back then. Uh, Guy Middleton, I think, was running. I don't know if that was the year he was running. There were several others. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, we'd gone from governor to lieutenant governor back to governor. And by the, you know, at that point, we'd, when, he, when he got back in, he had fairly well consolidated a lot of the Democratic support mm-hmm. uh, in terms of money, in terms of legislators, um, in terms of leadership in the African-American community. Um, he, he had pretty well consolidated that. And um, so off we were. So there was a pri- there was a primary. It was Lewis Massey. Lewis Massey, David Poitras. That's right. Steve Langford. He jumped up. Um, but it was it was almost without a runoff. Forty nine percent of the vote, and um, Lewis decided not to contest the primary. Right. And there was a a, a press conference in Governor Miller's office with Lewis and Roy, and, you know, we were off to the general election, except we still had a primary and we didn't want to be embarrassed, so we still had to, you know, get the some, folks do to, some things, yeah. Get the folks to the polls. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Attorney General Bowers, Mike Bowers, um, revelation about his private life, um, a scandal. He stayed in the race, mm-hmm. um, but... Guy Milner making his third run yeah. for, for for statewide office was able to. I think it, he won without a runoff. Uh, he did. in '98. He did. Uh, unlike '96, which was a knockdown drag out with yeah. with Johnny Isaacson. Yeah. Um, tell me about that that campaign. Your approach to running against. Well, we were um, the Guy underdog. Milner. I mean, we were. I mean, it's self funder. Mm-hmm. Um, the state was trending notwithstanding Max in 1996. Um, And uh, we were trailing in the polls the whole time, pretty much. Um, And, uh, I mean, we ran, Roy's message was education, healthcare choice. And he stuck to it. Do you think it was a a combination of- And And property tax reduction. So, so a combination of issue, issues, messaging, but also 98 turned out to be good year. A, a good year for Democrats. A midterm. A historically good midterm for, for, the, <laughs> for the, the party in the White House. Yeah. Um, so go, going into the, the, you become chief of staff. Mm-hmm. Um, is that a job you took um, happily? I had never Begrudgingly? Worked. I had never worked in government before, and, and I was a political a campaign person, but uh, no, I was happy to take it. I didn't, I didn't think I was going to do it, mm-hmm. but you know, a lot of that, some of that superstition. I mean, politicians and baseball players right. are very superstitious. Right. You don't step on the line. You don't talk about, you know, what You don't happens. talk to the pitcher. You don't be, the- I mean, uh, don't be measuring the drapes in the governor's office and that kind of stuff. That was, that was a line in previous campaigns. Sure, so sure. So-and-so was measuring the drapes in the governor's <laughs> office. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I didn't even, I really, I didn't think, of, it was irrational, but I didn't even think about it. And, um, but, he, you know, we talked like, well, for a couple of days after the election, like, the GBI and bureaucrats and stuff, they were coming to brief me, you know. I thought that was standard. I think they were interested in job security. But uh, anyway, and, and, and it was within a few days um, after the election. So how much coordination did, did you have as chief of staff with you know, the, Demo- the state Democratic Party, the DNC, the, the Clinton, what then Clinton White House? What's what was what, what is the political operation like in, in yeah. the governors? And well, I mean, we had a pretty active, coordinated campaign in '98, mm-hmm. and um, Dave Worley was the chairman, and John Krenchek was the executive director, and so the party was, you know, we were going to make sure the party was strong, both for our legislative agenda, but also in terms of elections. So there was a, a lot of coordination there. Um, I, I, I don't think with the White House it was that significant directly mm-hmm. 
I mean, if you compare what we did with the Clinton White House with what we did with the Bush White House, I mean, it was a lot of the same types of people. Of okay. course, with the Bush White okay. House, you had 9-11. Um, but we did talk to Keith Mason a lot, who mm -hmm. was had been in the Clinton White House, and then he was Gore's person here for the 2000 election. Um, and um, so in that regard, um, I mean, Keith was part of our team anyway, and, and, and we would deal with him a lot. Senator Cleland we'd deal with, um, and, and, and Steve Leeds with Senator Cleland. And, and so all that was, um, that's, how, that's how we did it. But I mean, there was a lot more, the Democratic Party of Georgia was much more part of our political organization than the DNC or okay. President Clinton or Vice President Gore. Right. How involved were you in, in the decision, um, Governor Barnes's decision to appoint um, Governor Miller to replace? Be because Governor Barnes and, and, and Senator Coverdell had been friends, yeah. long time colleagues and everything like that. What was the political calculus that went into that decision? Um, well, they were friends. In fact, uh, Roy delivered the eulogy, mm -hmm. one of the eulogies. Um, and, uh, I mean, right after, I mean, it was a shock, Senator Coverdell. Yeah. It was sudden, unexpected, and but within minutes, there were people calling it one of the appointments. You know, they were mourners, I like to call them. Uh, so, you know, there was a little time that went by, I don't know how much, but, uh, you know, we wanted to hold the seat. Right. I noticed in uh, Minnesota uh, that, that Governor Dayton's likely to appoint a caretaker. Mm -hmm. The lieutenant governor, who I think was his Tina chief Tina Smith, staff. correct. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, um, when Chris, um, Charlie Chris, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. left. Uh, Is that no, there was Mel a, Martinez? Yeah, he, re, he resigned to run for the... I mean, he resigned from the Senate, and so um, Chris appointed George Lemieux, right, fellow right, Emory grad, right, his chief of staff, to be a caretaker. Biden, uh, I think, uh, the same. Yeah, so. and um, well, there's a John theme. Kerry. There's a theme here. There is. That back in you know, back then you didn't appoint your chief of staff to be. Uh, <laughs> So I never was considered. What might have been. Yeah, yeah. I would be a lousy candidate, not too good of an office holder. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, uh, it, we wanted to hold the seat. And ironically enough, the way things turned out, the leadership in the Senate was, was putting a lot of heat on Roy to appoint Governor Miller. Were there any credible alternatives? There were a lot of alternatives, but it never really got to that. Okay. I mean, uh, once, I mean, we were focused on on Governor Miller and the, the leadership in the Senate. I, I remember we had a staff party at the mansion uh, during all that. It was just the regular annual staff party. And Tom Daschle called and was really putting the heat on, which is really ironic because uh, the way things turned a out. A national party no more. Uh, Governor Miller's book. Uh, he was really hard on Dashiell. Mm -hmm. so. Well, my my introduction to Georgia politics was my freshman year of college. Got up to my dorm room just in time to see Senator Miller um, threatening a duel on on Chris, Chris Matthews. Matthews. That was my introduction to Georgia politics I, 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 in 2004. I took my son to visit schools in Washington in 2009. And um, we got in, it's not an audience show, but we sat in while Chris Matthews was doing hardball. Mm -hmm. and, and we met him afterwards. And I said, yeah, I worked for the guy that appointed Zell Miller to the Senate. And, uh, I got a ha out of him. <laughs> so. he, he's got, I, th I think Chris Matthews got a lot of mileage out of 
Oh, yeah. out, out of that. So I think yeah. he, he'd call it, you don't call it equal. show that over and over again unless you want to. Right, right. <laughs> so the appointment comes in July 2000, yeah. I think. Um, so right right around convention season. And Keith, Keith Mason was, you know, mm-hmm. I talked to him about that. He was real involved. Sure. We were actually in, uh, in Washington at a DGA uh, event. Keith was up there. He's very active in the DGA. Oh, sure. And a lot of the talking was going on then. Roy ended up, when he got back, he flew up to Young Harris and went to see him. Hmm. Um, That wasn't on the public schedule. It was a last-minute edition. (laughs) (laughs) So, so... That's one of the the major, and you've you've spoken with Bob Short about issues like the flag and things like that, um, redistricting, mm-hmm. um, the most political process in America. Sure is. Walk me through how the Barnes administration approached redistricting, as opposed to previous administrations. Well. I mean, you know the history of redistricting right. here. In the 80s, the Black Caucus got together with the Republicans mm-hmm. and had the help of the Justice Department. Mm-hmm. In the 90s, it was every person for himself, and then the Justice Department got in it. And Governor Miller, who had, who knew better, said, no, uh, you know, I'm out of this is a legislative deal. But I, we couldn't afford to do that. We saw what was coming. Um, and uh, I mean, our view was we were pretty, maybe to our fault, we were pretty uh, frank about it. Was, you know, before lines were drawn to the desires of the individual members for their districts, Mm -hmm. even though they weren't their districts. (laughs) They were the voters' districts. Mm -hmm. That was was micro-political. There were, you know, we were gonna do what was done in a lot of states, and and we were gonna try to maximize democratic performance. And, and, And the maps produced democratic majorities. Uh, in a year that wasn't very good. <laughs> and this, um, yes. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to be hypocritical about this. It, it was done on politics. What bothers me is these Republicans who got up in the well, some of them cried, and then when they take over, they, 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 uh, they, they, do, they do what we did. <laughs> and... They're going to do it again. They're going to do mid-cycle redistricting in, in January. There were, my, my neck of the woods Athens. over, over yeah, in Athens. I mean, we, yeah. we picked up a couple of seats in Athens that the one nobody, and one nobody expected. Um, and, you know, they're, they're all... You really, you really think they'll, they'll go through with, oh yeah. with yeah. Yeah. redrawing? They, they, did, they tried it last, last year, and they ended up doing one. Mm-hmm. Um, they... they uh, they, they, they were trying to do like 10 or 11, and that was when Speaker Ralston really showed his hand. He, he took the well, and he said, this bill doesn't disadvantage one single member of this body. There again, these districts do not belong to the members of the body. They belong to the people. And when you do it, and when you disadvantage uh, minority voters in particular, it's a problem. And uh, so, uh, so we, yeah, we, we were political about it. Well, I mean, that's the that sort of gets but, to... But, I mean, what... One of, the, um, one of the most cohesive counties in the state is Clark. Right. The smallest geographic and, territory. I mean, it had, it had traditionally been kept together, I believe. Right. Yes, and, at least congressionally. Yeah, um, uh, but but also, I mean, in, in some cases, it had too many people for. Uh, it was a pact. That, yeah. Yeah. So, and they they cut it into how many districts for Senate and how many districts for House? Two, two, two for Senate and three, three for House. Yeah. One nineteen, one eighteen. Is that community of interest there? 
<laughs> well, that, that gets that gives get, you, you brought up communities of interest. You brought up you know, the political process uh, of of redistricting. There are a couple Supreme Court cases: um, Gill versus Whitford up in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember the name of the North Carolina uh, case. Do you think there is a a snowball's chance that the Supreme Court rules against partisan? I, I really don't know. I really don't know. Um, what would the what would the the practical effect be if there was some sort of decree that you cannot draw for unreasonable yeah. quote unquote partisan advantage? Yeah. Um, well, let me tell you a little story. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'll get to the point. <laughs> you can take your time. When I was the executive director of the party, um, two suburban legislators wanted to get rid of straight party voting mm -hmm. because they were getting clobbered. And I went in to see Speaker Murphy and I brought him all this data that showed how you know, there'd be a drop off and so on and so forth. And he tells me this story. He says, well, in the 50s, there was somebody who was a probate judge in Paulding County, or, and he tried to change election laws, and it helped in that election, and then it beat him in the next election. You don't go around messing with election laws because it will come back and bite you. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, as long as you're for me, whatever. <laughs> he, you definitely wanted him in your corner. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and we were we we had thought we had beat beaten the bill. Mm -hmm. um, and at the last night of the session, one of those suburban legislators, Senator Roy Barnes, tacks it on to some bill deal. deal. I think it was a housekeeping bill for the uh, Secretary of State. And there goes straight party voting. Now, it had already been removed after 72 from the presidential race. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think removing straight party voting probably elected Linda Shrinka and uh, John Oxenbein. Um, and so, anyway, um, when, you know, when you, when you mess around with that, it's gonna it's gonna turn on you at some mm -hmm. point. So what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we, let, let's move on from redistricting, and we'll we'll talk about redistricting. Oh, I, I, let, let's tell you. Oh, what, what the I have no idea what the Supreme Court sure. is going to do. I will tell you this: that um, um, if you listen to what the Republicans said when they were in the minority, you know, and you listen to what. Candidate Purdue said, "You know, we'd have a a um, nonpartisan commission, um, but you know, I don't know. I mean, I hear there are favorable rulings that keep coming, but I I, I couldn't tell you what the Supreme Court is going to do." Speaking of, of of candidate Purdue, um, what was your role in the the 2002 reelect as chief of staff? Did you did you stay as chief of staff, and and how did that work? I. I had planned on going over the campaign uh, after the session. Okay. And then we had a few things come up. I didn't go over there until the summer. The campaign manager was the guy who ran um, Max's campaign in 96, um, Tim Phillips, who did a good job for Max and did a good job for Roy. Um, but I went over the campaign because I was, it, I was increasingly there were too much, too much. There was too much politics going on, so I left the governor's office. Um, I guess I was sort of a senior advisor. I don't know. I, I had no title. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, yeah. So I went over the campaign, and it was a very frustrating campaign and a very tough result. What fr what obviously the result was frustrating. What was what frustrated you about the campaign itself? There was nothing we could do to move the numbers okay. for Roy, regardless nothing. of message, regardless. And of we we did. I mean, we had the resources. I sure, mean, I'm we, sure. Uh, we we actually spent a lower percentage on television than you typically spend. We spent a lot of money, but we had money to do other stuff. We had a very good field program. 
very good get out the vote program. But we were able to do things like in, in different markets test different messages. You know, we, we, we would never do that in Atlanta. <laughs> but we would see if we can move things. Uh, and, and he, after he changed the flag, yeah, he, his reelect never got over fifty percent, and his performance never got over fifty percent. The the loss of support. Could you could you tell where that support was? That the loss support was concentrated. Was it was it South Georgia? Was it rural areas? I can tell you what happened on election night. Yeah. Uh, Ware County came in. Go and look that up. We won Ware County in 1998. We got clobbered there in, uh, in, in 2002, and that came in fairly early. And, and we knew we were going to take a hit, mm -hmm. but it was bad, and the turnout was up. And then on the northern suburbs, northern exurbs, the gro there was so much growth. And I think our performance was actually a little better than what it was in 98. But that means we were getting 27, not 25. Sounds out of a much bigger pot. This sounds eerily familiar to the, the, the 2016 presidential election where, where Hillary Clinton overperformed slightly in the suburbs and exurbs, but huge turnout yeah. and, and margins in yeah. the rural area yeah. Among, yeah. among conservative white voters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of the same thing. And, uh, and Roy got. Uh, 23, 24% of the white vote. Sort of the, I, I believe that's the high, well, 98 was the high water yeah. mark, but I don't think any, no statewide Democratic candidate has received more than 24. He got 20 in I, 2010. Yeah, I, I think Michelle Nunn got 24% in, in 2014. Uh, it may, I don't think it was that high. I don't think well, we can, we can go back. Yeah. Somewhere go between 20 tape. and 24. Yeah. I'll um, tell you this. Not good enough for I'll tell you this. If, if Roy, this is an ironic thing, if Roy had gotten in 2010 the same percentage of the white vote he received in 2002, he probably would have won in 2010 mm -hmm. because the non white vote had increased. Right. So much. Right. Could any could any Democrat have a, skipping ahead to two thousand ten? Could any Democrat, other than Roy Barnes, Roy Barnes, Dubose Porter, the the Thurbert Baker, ha, have done any better in a two thousand ten election cycle? That was a bad cycle for so Democrats. So it was two thousand fourteen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I mean midterms. Uh, in fact, the first Clinton midterm. Yeah, the Obama midterms. Were pretty disastrous. Very. It was, it was the second Clinton midterm that, uh, which is when Roy won, um, that, uh, that that is the only one that was good. That's why there's hope for uh, 2018. We don't have how many how many conversations or paragraphs start like this. If Hillary had won, <laughs> this would be a much tougher. It's going to be a tough general election anyway, but sure. it would be a much tougher general election. Well, we will get to that. Um, but between 2004 and 2007, you become state party chairman. Yeah. What's the difference between state party chairman and executive director? Well, um, you don't get paid when you're the chair. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> um, it's not a full-time job. Right. Uh, but, I mean, I, I worked with a good staff. What was your chief responsibility? You know, executive director, day to day. Well, I was a little different as chairman because I'd been executive director. Right. So, I, you know, a lot of the, I worked with Jeff DeSantis, who was the executive director. Right. And and you know, I knew a lot of when he would tell me stuff, I, I knew immediately just day to day compliance and that sort of thing. I, I didn't have to mess with, but I didn't have to be educated on it either. Right. Um, but I, I, it was it was not day to day, you know. I, I would hold press conferences, a few too many, I'm told. Uh, again, you know, with respect to Governor Purdue, but I'd work with the the legislature, the the Democrats, mm -hmm. you know, on targeting and stuff. It was a tough time. So 2006. Speaking of midterms, yeah. this was. Uh, 
a, a good midterm for Democrats, 2006. Not here. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Um, but Democrats statewide, were there were st some statewide Democrats who were able to hold on. Yeah. Um, John Barrow, Jim Marshall were able to win. Yeah. Um, walk me, th how were Democrats able to hold on in 2006 where we're in, we're in a, a case now in Georgia where there are no statewide elected um, Democrats to constitutional office or, yeah. or higher, and, and those congressional Democrats that are there are, are in major, majority minority yeah. districts. Yes. Um, I mean, it, it's, all, it's about candidate recruitment um, in a lot of cases, and you know, these were incumbents that were hanging on. Um, they, they'd been elected before, they, their fundraising ability was good. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they, they ran their own campaigns. I mean, the party did, did things. We did turn out. Um, but, you know, we were, we were clearly uh, disadvantaged. Right. So. Why, you know, given, given you know, the fact that you sort of witnessed the wave <laughs> coming, why were Democrats in Georgia able to hold on longer than, say, Democrats in places like Alabama or South Carolina? Uh, part of it is uh, Carter. Uh, part of it is, I mean, I, I would attribute it to the incumbents mm -hmm. and the quality of the candidates, candidate recruitment. Um, I will also attribute it to the Republicans. Um, here, we'll go ahead and pause that. Okay, before we, we broke, um, we were talking about why the Democrats were able to hold on to power so long, or you know, alternatively, why the Republicans were not able to, to become the governing or majority party in the state for as long as it, it took. I, I, a couple things, uh, like I said, uh, one of it was the quality of the candidates on both sides. Um, we, we had good candidates and, and they didn't. Um, and the other was, I think Carter was a factor mm -hmm. in stemming the tide. Um, you saw the first uh, of, I mean, the first wave was in 80, even though Carter won, he got clobbered in Gwinnett and Cobb. I remember, I, remember, um, I, I came over to Atlanta for the Carter victory party. That was the first year of the red and blue, but the networks hadn't, <laughs> hadn't, hadn't conformed to each other. And so you'd look at it like 10 after seven, you'd look at the maps and one of them would be all red and one of them would be all blue. And I was back in the library at law school by nine o'clock. <laughs> I, I, you know, I got out of there. I know how long it takes to drive from yeah, the, the law and, library to, and, to, and, to and, mid downtown. But I'm walking to class the next day and I see the Atlanta Constitution and it said Mattingly had won. <laughs> Cobb County takes a long time to count votes. Yeah, well, it was Gwinnett too. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, and then, and then after that, you'd have the wave, but still, you know, we were winning. Um, but there's something about Republicans. Uh, and this is why there's hope be, for, for it turning back even sooner than you would normally think. Well, first it's Trump, but then the Republicans think they got to where they got to because they're geniuses. <laughs> Not because of demographics and our screw-ups. <laughs> and that's why we're going to be able to take it back. That's why we won the 6th Senate District. Minor victory in the scheme of things. But, you know, they're, and they're making the same mistakes we make. Um, they're not, they're thinking they can just do what's right by them in the legislature, just pay narrow attention to some legislative interests, interests and pork and stuff like that, and, and, and not think about a broader appeal. And both in Georgia and nationally, the Republicans are, are in a box now, you know. 
when that manifests itself, I can't tell you. But um, on the other hand, Democrats, we got to do a better job of recruiting. And uh, there were some races, and you probably know this better than I do, but there were some House races, state House races in 16 and 14, that if there had been that warm body, um, we would have won more seats. Um, I remember, I can't remember the guy's name, but there was a committee chair in, 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 in Gwinnett in the 80s. I, he, was a, he was a great legislator. And he, and he got swamped in 84 by a warm body who, uh, who went on to serve 10 years and really, I mean, he, 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 he was nothing compared to the guy he beat. I'll just say that. Um, but we, we left some warm body, and, and frankly, that's the biggest, that, that's one of the problems I have with Stacey Abrams. I am for Stacey Evans. I, 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 I think uh, Stacey Abrams did a poor job at recruiting, and I talked to her about it in 2014. Uh, but in 2014 and 16, she left a lot on the table. How much of that is the fault of, of, of the minority leader, Stacey Abrams, and how, how much is, is the fault of the, the Democratic Party of Georgia, such as it is, the, sta the state that it's in, well, or was in, yeah. in 2014? Well, when you, I mean, when you don't have a governor's office, the, the caucuses have to take the lead in recruiting. Now, the party needs to provide support. And, and the party was poised to sort of provide support. Um, I mean, the, the former Speaker Pro Tem and Democratic leader of the House, Gabos Porter, was there. And, you know, so I don't think she can point to him. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, there were, there were just some seats that, for what a, a, it, it boggles my mind, some of the seats that were, that, that were left. And, and even when there were people in there, you know, they, they chose not to put uh, resources there. I mean, I'm not saying they have an unlimited amount of money, but some of the places they did put money, uh, you know, compared to where they could have. And I'm very sensitive. I've been Monday morning quarterback by the best of them. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I'm, I just think that there's some missed opportunities there. Okay, so I, I want to unpack that for a second. First, you said um, President Trump is and will be a factor. What do you think the long term, the short and long term effect of, of, a, of a Trump administration, a Trump presidency, is going to be on the Republican Party of Georgia, but also on the Democratic Party of Georgia's ability to, to, to win back seats or become more competitive, at least? Well, I think that. Um uh, I mean, we've been on a trend. The demographics have been in our favor for, for I have been improving, not in our favor, have been improving for a while. I mean, even if you just compared 98 to 10. Sure, yeah. Uh, and and, and, and uh, I think Trump can accelerate that. Now, whether that's, whether you pick up a couple of points and you grow from there, I can't answer that, but I think I think you look at this election, you look at the, the Athens races, you look at the um, state senate race, you look at the mayor's race in Atlanta. If Mary Norwood had responded, if she'd gone on television and said, I disagree with Donald Trump, she probably would have won. But now it's for Vincent Ford, but in the runoff, Keisha Lance Bottoms, hit Mary Norwood on Trump. I mean, that's an old trick. I mean, it used to happen to us all the time. I mean, it still happens to us with Nancy Pelosi and whoever, but Teddy Kennedy, Michael Dukakis, Walter Mondale, all that stuff. Right. San Francisco Democrats. Um, but, you know, so, uh, but it also, I mean, you can't feel too good about it because it, it, it provides him with pretty good base. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, his base, 
the Republican base in Georgia is larger than the Trump base nationally. Right. And 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 I don't think the extra ten percent or whatever uh, is going to leave the Republican nominee because of, that doesn't like Donald Trump because of Donald Trump. It's the independents mm -hmm. that, particularly women. Um, and the suburbs. I mean, the suburbs are trending our way. I mean, that was that, flipping the script on, on the 1980s and 90s. Mean, that that, that and the, yeah, that was the suburbs was where we were getting clobbered. I mean, you look at Gwinnett, you look at Cobb, um, and you you even go to North Fulton. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were stories. I opened the New York Times during the uh, Ossoff race, and there's a story on Johns Creek of all places. And that, that's where they have uh, Flip the Six and Pave It Blue, mm -hmm. and, and it's women. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think I think we need to uh, capitalize on that, but I think it gives us an advantage. And you know, do you think there's any any way any policy message that that Democrats, Democratic candidates can employ to win back the old white, rural, conservative, Reagan Democrat, Trump Democrat, what, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> Not that they would have been Democrats by the yeah, time they were voting for Donald yeah, Trump. Yeah, I, um, I hope so. And you would think it would be health care. Closing the rural hospitals, the you know, failure to expand Medicaid. I mean, yeah, on a macro level, I get it. You don't want big government. But the hospitals are closing, and you're not on health insurance. Peach care is yeah. sort of up in the air right now. Yeah, which, which was a, a signature program for Governor Miller and Hillary Clinton. Um, that was a huge thing here. That was very popular. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, Governor Miller talked about that, um, I guess, in the Senate race. Uh, as much as anything, but uh, you you would think it would be health care uh, and the economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure that you know the the, the cut in corporate taxes is is going to find its way to to rural Georgia. Um, so on on the Republican side, um, what do you see as the, the 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 major divisions or fault lines within? The Georgia Republican Party, setting aside you know, national politics, you know, some some people say, you know, that Joe Frank Harris, for example, would have made a great Republican governor. Um, George Busby might have as well. What's the, the difference the, between those old Georgia Democrats and the Republican? George party Busby of and Joe Frank Harris would have been called big spending liberals by the Republicans. I mean, there's not much difference between among the Republicans because they're, especially now, they're having to cater to the Trump base. But, you know, they're in a real, the legislators in particular are, are in a real quandary. I mean, they're, they're, they're getting older. Not the legislature, their support is getting older. Oh, the base, yeah. the, the, the constituency. Uh, yeah, and they're being replaced by by younger millennials who may not be Democrats, but they're not Republicans either. And um, that, that finds its way to statewide official officers. I mean, I, I can't remember, a couple of years ago, the state convention was in Athens. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, there were two big issues they were talking about, one of which was religious freedom. I can't remember the other, but it, it, it wasn't the economy. <laughs> it wasn't education. Oh, it was vouchers. It was education. I'm sorry. It was vouchers. Vouchers and religious freedom. That's what they talked about at the state convention. Because that's what, anim you, you mentioned earlier that the, the Republican Party of Georgia is sort of in a box. It, are they boxed in by their policy priorities or are they boxed in by can, their, their constituents' ex expectations? Both. Um, nobody will take a chance. I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what would happen if they took a chance. It could be that, um, that, that, that 
that, that somebody could take a chance and pick up some votes. But, you know, I mean, we, the issues are on our side long term. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that's why there's hope, I, you know, uh, a fair amount of hope. So, you know, what are the top priorities of the Georgia Republican Party? Is, is it mainly uh, to, to create a, a pro-business, pro-growth environment, or, or is it, how, how would you articulate it, the, the priorities it, of the Republican yeah, Party? It's, it's on the fringes. It's on the fringes. It's, it, 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 it's pr play into people's fears. It, it, it's religious freedom. You know, to his credit, Governor Deal vetoed that. But look where we'd be without it. We, we, I mean, if, we, if they passed it, mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't have all these movies. For that matter, if, we'd, uh, if, if, if we hadn't changed the flag, we, we wouldn't have these movies, we wouldn't have these Fortune 500 companies. NCAA. Uh, NCAA. Uh, listen, here's a little scoop for you. I may have said it before. That was the, 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 the primary impetus for the timing of the flag change. Was that when the Final Four was? Was it basketball? I'll send this to you. Mm -hmm. We got Dan Graveline, who was the World Congress Center director, mm -hmm. and Ray Crawford, who died a few years ago, but he was Properties Commission, and they worked a lot together. I'll never forget, they came over, and they handed me this letter. It was in March of 2000. And it was from the NCAA, and they they were threatening a boycott. And they had a list; it was an attachment of of all the upcoming events, Final Fours. You know, we didn't even have the. I mean, we we didn't even have the college football finals right. then. But I mean, I'm not sure we'd have the. We could have afforded, or had had the events to support the Mercedes-Benz State. Right. Um, if we hadn't changed the flag. S sort of like what what North Carolina yeah. has been faced with. It's what uh, South Carolina was faced with. Right. I mean, they were they their time they were on the same timetable we were, and and they didn't even have it in their state flag. It was on the grounds. Right. And they didn't, and they and they they had a lot less to lose. We did. I think we probably would have lost. The final four, which would have been in five or two thousand five or two thousand six. Mm -hmm. I mean that, and, we, and we, you know we could have lost the Peach Bowl, mm -hmm. you know, or it wouldn't be an NCAA sanctioned event. And uh, there were women's final four. Yep, SEC, regional SEC, SEC championships ACC, were here in six. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, and, the tornado. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it, we could have lost a lot, but you know we're facing that again. And 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 the movies. Mm -hmm. I mean, say what you want about the tax credits. I mean, the, 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 the economists can study the effects of that uh, all they want and whether it's worth it, but we have a lot of movies here. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, More features started in Georgia than in Hollywood. I mean, there's, there's stuff you see on Netflix or, or, or like AMC, mm -hmm. and, you, and you, you see at the end, the old peach at the end. Who knew? I mean, sometimes you say, well, I recognize that. It's the Hyatt. Right. Uh, <laughs> looks like the Hyatt. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, we wouldn't have, you know. But, but if you left it up to the legislature and the candidates for statewide office, they are catering to those there people. There does seem to be a, a pretty stark uh, disjuncture between candidates for, for office, especially statewide office. I'm, I'm speaking about the Republican Party. Yeah. Versus the the outlook and and mindset of a governor deal, a speaker Ralston, uh, Chris Riley who has gone on record saying you know that the, these are issues that are important to the state. That you know, the, there's a difference between the governing party versus the the campaigning party. Yeah. yeah. So you know, once you have to govern, you do have cho tough choices to make. Mm -hmm. But every one of those candidates for governor is singing the same song, especially on religious freedom. Now, the 6th Senate District, I mean, they got the message. Of course, that's Buckhead. It's also Cobb. Mm -hmm. They got the message. None of them were for religious freedom. 
The special election. The, the um, religious freedom legislation. Right, the, the RIFRA bill, um, whose main sponsor is running for Secretary of State. Oh, is that Josh McCoon? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he will know better. Uh, the sixth, uh, sixth congressional district, which we are in. We, we are in. Right now. Um, John Ossoff um, came out of nowhere. I don't think anybody knew. How, how, was, how was somebody, 31, 32? 30. 30. 30. I think it's 30. 30. So he's younger than me. Um, come out of nowhere and, and put up you know, 48%, a loss, obviously, but 48% in a district that was drawn for Republicans. Uh, there's a lot I can tell you about that race. I mean, even without getting into the campaign itself. Mm -hmm. um, somebody called me a, mo a week after the election. I'll just tell you, the mayor of Brookhaven. Okay. Uh, he called and said, you know, there's people talking about running for this. I think it's a good, I think there's a good shot. Um, I said, are you crazy? <laughs> I didn't even know that district. You know, they had swapped out Cherokee mm -hmm. for North DeKalb. Now, North DeKalb's not DeKalb, but it ain't Cherokee either. And by the way, the reason they did that was because the governor was not happy with Tom Price. I got that from Tom Price himself. <laughs> but, uh, so it, it was, but even with that, that was tough. Mm -hmm. That was really tough. And then the, 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 you got the presidential results. The Trump only won it by two. Right. And, 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 and I met with John um, in December of uh, last year, and he told me what his plans were. Uh, now, we ended up, I contributed to him, and we ended up placing his time. Uh, but, you know, I, I was just meeting with him because a friend asked him to. And he told me what his plans were. And I'm not a big issues guy, but my wife was there for part of it. And she is. And, I mean, he was very good. I mean, he, 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 knew, he knows. He, he's very good on the issues. And he clearly had given a lot of thought to running for Congress and serving in Congress. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, he's young, but he was good, and he, you know, he he will be a great elected official. Do you think his performance is is a because of a blend of the structural changes that we've been talking about, the demographic changes, and, and sort of the short term political situation involved in, in so, as we said, those those upwardly mobile suburbs mm -hmm. um, as a reaction to, to the, the, the Trump election? It's probably a combination, uh, like you say, but I, I, I think I like to look at what uh, Jason Carter and Michelle Nunn did. And they were in the 30s, I believe, in that district. Low 40s, maybe? Maybe. Nowhere near what Hillary got. But um, the women in that district boosted John's numbers, mm -hmm. and I think we got a shot at keeping that vote for for a lot of candidates. Well, the sixth Senate district, a lot of it is in the sixth right. congressional right. district, um, and uh, so so you know what's going on, what was going on then. I mean, you take it from the the march the day after the inauguration to what's going on now with harassment and such. Um, I mean, that's Roy Moore. <laughs> uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> it's, 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 it's uh, I mean, Democrats are going to have to earn it, but they're getting a look that they wouldn't normally get. Do you think John Ossoff's performance in the six makes it more likely to recruit a, a high-quality candidate in, in, in a place like the 7th over in Gwinnett County against Rob Woodall. I do. I do. I, I, I mean, there's, there's people running for state legislature mm -hmm. that, you know, w wouldn't have run before. And you saw that this time. Mm -hmm. uh, in Athens, you saw it in some of the other specials. Virginia. Yeah. Uh, the Virginia elections. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just talking about legislative races here. I mean, we may not win them, but we're doing a lot better. 
and you know. Well, what was the old saying that that, that Republicans suffered their their biggest losses on qualifying day? <laughs> well, we need to learn from that. <laughs> and what about At least qualify somebody? Right, right. Uh, what about the Republican side? Uh, you know, you've talked about Stacey Evans and Stacey Abrams. Um, you know the, the sort of the breakdown of, of demographics within the Republican, or the, excuse me, the Democratic Party of Georgia. Um, what, what do you think the, the lay of the land is with the Republicans? Um, Casey Cagle's obviously the the favorite right now. I don't know if that's just because name recognition. Yeah. Um, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, the Republican Party is basically old and white, and more male than female. <laughs> Could describe me. <laughs> Noted Republican Bobby Kahn. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Democrats are a much broader party mm -hmm. and, and younger people. When I came out of law school, my classmates, they were, they were Republicans. It was Reagan, you know. Right. And, and now people, it's Trump. He ain't Reagan, <laughs> uh, and, um, and and that that's affecting them. It's affecting their vote. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they care about jobs. They care about the economy. They care about fairness, equality, uh, which religious freedom is not. Which you know, the Republicans running for governor are not talking about those issues. Switching gears abruptly and, um, and, and roughly, um, you know, I want to talk about how has how how is like Citizens United? We talk about media, um, the political advertising media. How has Citizens United changed the approach to to, to advertising and media uh, in politics? Well, we benefit from Citizens United. <laughs> Let me say that. But At least you can say it. <laughs> it, it it's terrible policy. Mm -hmm. Um, it, 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 it marginalizes the parties. Uh, the, the party organization. The party the, organization. The formal. Or even, the, you know, just the entity, the party. Um, there's still a incentive, an incentive in Georgia for state races to, to work with the party. It's this group of candidates. Um, part of the law that was used in the mayor's race, actually. Um, but, you know, you, you have a Koch brothers or, you know, Democratic, the, the party committees actually have other committees that, that you know, serve it. Actually, the leadership. Yeah, tax. like House majority yeah, or Senate yeah, majority. Yeah, they, they really aren't the party. Mm -hmm. But they're close, they're close enough that it's better than, you know, some of these groups that just pop up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and spend money, but it marginalizes the parties. And, and it, you know, it's not good for a candidate who's trying to control the message. You know, sometimes that gets in the way. Um, Is there an example that you, I'm trying to <laughs> scramble to think? Well, but, but, but yes, if, if you take the, the letter of the law, there can be no coordination. Right. Um, and, Yet somehow affect you know there. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, it, it, it's a little out there, but it was when John Barrow won his last race. Okay. In okay. 2012, mm -hmm. um, the guy running against him from Columbia County, um, he run, he wasn't running much of a campaign. And the D triple, the, the NRCC, the Republican Campaign Committee, and uh, maybe Americans for Prosperity, the Koch brothers, maybe mm -hmm. they came in. There was a lot uh, spent on the other side. Right. But John was able to hang on because John's a good candidate, was a good member of Congress. But also, he had a clear message. And even though they were allies, I mean, they were sort of following the lead uh, uh, of his campaign. There was no lead to follow. Uh, I see. I in, see. In this race, and so it was hard. So it can compound 
pro problems within yeah, the campaign yeah, if, there, yeah. if there's no sense of yeah, and also if, direction. If, if you're trying to, you know, it does squeeze out candidates' ability to, even though a federal candidate has a right of access, you know, the, 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 the clutter and everything and the access is, is, is lessened. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the message is kind of, you know, stepped on. Speaking of messages and, and muddling, social media, yeah. advertise, there's online advertising and then there's using social media. We saw some of that in the 2016 election of you know, f fake news, pu push stories, things yeah. like. How can, can advertisers or candidates or the parties gauge the, the, the usefulness, effectiveness of, of social media? Um, in campaigning or advertising. That's a big challenge. Campaigns. That's a big challenge. And I mean, this goes back to 04 with Howard Dean. Ah. Um, and, the and Deaniacs. It was emails back then. Mm -hmm. And he raised a lot of money with email. Um, and then President Obama really took it to the next level. And, all, you know, social, the internet, social media is, is um, one of the reasons that he won is what people say. The conventional wisdom says, well, it didn't hurt that he s spent a hundred million dollars on other things. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're if you're a car dealer and, and you're on social media, you can measure when people come in if you have a coupon or something. Um, the only way to measure it in campaigns is is if um, your web traffic. Okay. Is increased. And there's, you know, there's measurements of that and so on. But in terms of whether you're talking to people that, who are already for you or you're persuading people, that, I, that has not been demonstrated. And, you know, President Obama would have been a force in a movement without social media. Right. It was just one of the tools that, that he used. Um, what what effect does the the fact that when you're dealing with media, you're dealing with the FCC, you know, the the, the regulators, things like that. But the, the place, place like Facebook, um, yeah, those those are the pri yeah. pr proprietary algorithms, yeah. and, and that, that, does that sort of shield the sort of those data analytics that we, you were talking about um, that the company may know and understand, but the candidate themselves or their campaigns might not, or, or let alone researchers. Yeah, like not, without getting into the weeds too much. Right. When you, when you advertise, or, or if you're a broadcaster or cable company and you sell advertising, you, you are subject to FCC right. uh, regulation because you're granted licenses and you, you, you're to serve the public good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether you do that or not is another matter. but. Right. There's clear. There, there is legislation. There's clear law and regulation, um, which you can make a career of. Uh, <laughs> um, newspapers really aren't under that. You know, the, the same disclosure requirements and lotion at charge and stuff. It was, it was part of um, the post Watergate reforms. Mm -hmm. The the initially was laws, supposed yeah. to apply to uh, newspapers, and that got struck. That was struck. Um, how you get to regulate Facebook and, and Google and, and Internet company, Twitter and whatever, I mean, requiring sponsorship identification and a public file, I, I, I don't, you know, that's beyond me. I don't know how they get to it. I, I think it would be good if they could. Mm -hmm. And it may be um, voluntary, given what happened. Right. But whether you know, there's no license to take away. Uh, right. Like the FCC can do. Um, I mean, you might be able to get to them through the fact through through the internet providers. I don't know. Um, that, that's way beyond me. Well, is there anything else? You know, we sort of. A, a wide-ranging discussion yeah, today. Yeah. Uh, what else 
what what better to do on a snowy Friday it's than talk down, history? Too. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you very much, sure. Bobby Kahn. Really do appreciate your time. Sure. Honor and a privilege. All right. Uh,